can hear me, so I'm not going to use the microphone, and that's okay. Uh, this is Paranormal 101, a talk that I have uh, given at this conference for many years. I've been um, coming to the conference probably for, oh, maybe 20 years now. Uh, I remember when it was uh, quite small, and now we have, I don't know how many registrants, which is very gratifying to see that um, we, the uh, organization has grown and is able to support programs for lots more patients. Well, this is Scleroderma 101. I'm Dr. Maureen Mays, and I direct the Scleroderma Clinic at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston. There are now several Scleroderma specialized clinics around the country, which is certainly not the case when I first started out. What I would love to do is just start off with an overview of what is scleroderma, talk about some of the um, uh, language and terms that are commonly used, and then just open it up for questions. Uh, first of all, there are 20 
It's just that single patch of morphia never spreads. We don't know why it happens. We don't know why it spreads in some people and not in others. But it uh, tends to involve only the skin and the structures underlying the skin. So the uh, back pad underneath this area will thin. And people who have a lot of morphia on one leg will have a thinner leg on that side than on the other side because they've lost the subcutaneous tissue, the subcutaneous fat. And this is a patient of mine. And if you look very carefully, uh, you can see the outline of this patch, this scar tissue thick in the skin. Uh, she really doesn't have a ring around it. The photo makes it look a little purplish. But this is just a single area of thickened skin over the foot. That's all it ever was. Uh, and uh, some, I also have other patients who start out with something like this, and then it tends to um, spread with other patches over the uh, top of the foot and then over the leg. So localized, involves the skin and the underlying tissues, it doesn't involve the internal organs, it does not involve the lungs or the heart or the kidneys. Um, if it's linear, it's a line of thickened skin down one arm, down one leg. Now on Cousaw, that I mentioned, that's French, or kind of the same. A line of thickened skin. It's involved the forehead. Sometimes it can extend into the scalp as well. Uh, and then more via these patches of thickened skin can occur anywhere on the body. A single patch or multiple patches. So that's morphia. Now I'm going to talk about systemic sclerosis, systemic sclerosis, and limited versus diffuse disease. So almost everyone with systemic sclerosis has Raynaud's phenomenon. Who here has Raynaud's? It's common. Uh, it uh, is an exaggerated response to cold. So everybody, when you get cold, your fingers will uh, feel numb and singly if you're out long enough. And before I moved to Texas, I lived in Michigan. So in the middle of uh, the winter in Michigan, if you were out even with gloves on after an hour or so, your hands get tingly. Well, this change of loss of, of uh, circulation with this pale appearing color can occur to people who have Raynaud's phenomenon within minutes of cold exposure. It doesn't take an hour of being outside. It can occur almost instantaneously. And this is the same one. Well, this is a, a, a patient of mine who took photos and emailed them to me. Uh, and you see, of course, the, the pale uh, changes in that finger, but if you look carefully, you also see the other change of Raynaud's, which is this purplish discoloration. So some, sometimes people will say that the fingers will all turn purple, and then sometimes one or two will turn white, sometimes they'll turn white, and then if you warm up a little, they turn purple, and it just goes back and forth. Um, there are two types of Raynaud's. One is something called primary Raynaud's, because Raynaud's phenomenon is common in the general population. It's been estimated that 5 to 10 percent of the adult American population will have at least one brain nose attack at some time in their life. More common in women, so maybe 10 percent, less common in men, maybe that's the 5 percent. But if it's primary, there are no other symptoms of problems. They don't get finger ulcers, they don't have thicker type skin, no fucking hands, but it is uh, a sort of warning signal to patients and to physicians to look for something else because a small proportion of these individuals will really have secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, which means that they do have another disease associated with it, most commonly scleroderma, sometimes mixed connective tissue disease, sometimes lupus. So it's important if people have Raynaud's phenomenon that it be brought to the attention of their physician who will likely want to do at least a blood test for an ANA to see if there's any hints, either by physical exam or by blood tests, that this is more than primary Raynaud's. If all of the other tests are normal, that's reassuring. 
If they're not, then this person needs to be monitored because you either may have scleroderma already or you're at a higher risk for developing it. So that's renos. Now, limited versus diffuse skin involvement. In limited disease, which is about 60% of all scleroderma patients, there is skin involvement, skin thickening, that involves the fingers, sometimes the forearms, sometimes the feet and lower legs, plus and minus the face. But this is at onset, and this is five years later and 10 years later. It's limited. It will always be limited. It doesn't progress to diffuse. On the other hand, there are people who have the diffuse form of the disease, which is to say within months to a year or a couple of years, the skin involvement has progressed. It's not just the fingers. It's the forearms, the upper arms, sometimes the trunk, sometimes the legs as well. So uh, the distinction between limited and diffuse scleroderma is not made on the basis of whether or not people have internal organ involvement. It is based solely on whether or not they have more or less extensive skin involvement. And the reason to make that distinction from the point of view of a physician is that people who have more extensive skin involvement, like the diffuse disease, tend to have more frequently internal organ involvement as well. So people with diffuse disease are followed a little more frequently, a little more carefully than people with the limited disease. So for diffuse skin thickening, not just of the fingers, but also of the upper arms and thighs, in addition to the fingers and hands, 40% of scleroderma cases. And what we worry about is that it can be associated, not 100% of the time, but more frequently it's associated with the more progressive kind of scar tissue in the lungs or lung fibrosis. We worry about renal crisis due to scleroderma. And then significant gastrointestinal disease and rarely cardiac disease as well. But each patient is different, and each person will have a different combination of internal organ involvement. So uh, it is rare for anybody to have all of these things. And one of the big unknowns in scleroderma is why one person will have limited skin involvement and a lot of GI involvement, and someone else will have diffuse skin and lung disease, but no GI involvement. So, things to remember that localized scleroderma or morphia is not limited systemic disease. And one of the things that we see in limited disease and also in long-standing disease, by long-standing I mean five years, 10 years, 20 years, people tend to get these red spots, these telangiectasias, which just means um, some en enlargement of a small blood vessel that it can occur on the, hand, the fingers, it can occur on the face, it can also occur on the lips and sometimes on the tongue and the mucosa as well. It's, um, other than the fact that everybody hates it, uh, it doesn't really mean anything in terms of the disease itself. Uh, they tend to accumulate over time. So if you start out with a couple of red spots, then there'll be more red spots. Uh, they can, uh, in, in terms of treating them, the uh, only thing that I'm aware of that can be helpful is some laser uh, treatment for the skin. Limited disease, so skin thickening can find to the uh, distal extremities, and usually it has more mild internal organ involvement, and it's associated with something called the asymmetry antibodies. Now, most people with scleroderma will have conflict ANA, which is an anti-nuclear antibody. That happens about 90% of scleroderma patients. Does anybody here know if they have an positive ANA? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean sure. <laughs> this is sort of basic scleroderma stuff that you should be aware of. And um, the, one of the problems with the ANA test is that it's also present in almost everybody who has lupus. 
So if you have Raynaud's and you go to your doctor and your hands are a little puffy and you're achy and the doctor does a blood test, it's an ANA. And it's positive, then he or she is likely to tell you that you have lupus. That's, I can see some heads nodding as people are frequently sort of misdiagnosed early on as lupus and then it becomes apparent only later that it's not lupus, it's scleroderma. Well, one of the subtypes of anti-nuclear antibodies is called a centromere antibody. And that's associated with the limited form of the disease. So if you happen to have scleroderma, perhaps having the anti-centromere antibody positive form is a little better. Uh, and this has also been called CREST, which stands for calcinosis, the Raynaud's phenomenon that pretty much everybody has. Esophageal dysmotility, which results in heartburn and reflux, common in scleroderma. And then sclerodactyly, which is a very fancy way of saying tight skin of the fingers, thick skin, and then the telangiectasias, the uh, red spots. So, what we worry about, and one thing that should be monitored in any scleroderma patient, limited or diffuse, not with localized disease, but with systemic disease that uh, what we worry about is that there will be pulmonary fibrosis. So the same kind of scarring, the collection of collagen that occurs in the skin is also occurring in the lungs. You can get something at, called pulmonary hypertension, which is high blood pressure in the lungs, and this is independent of the blood pressure in your arm. So people can have normal or even low blood pressure in their arms and still have high pressure in the lungs. The way that you know about it, it causes shortness of breath. But what we would like to do is identify that, just like with the, the blood pressure, the high blood pressure in your arms, if it's there and you're unaware of it, your doctor's going to treat it because they know that uncontrolled blood pressure in your arms after five or ten years is going to affect your heart and your kidneys. And the thing to, the way to protect that, to prevent complications from happening, is to diagnose the high blood pressure early and treat it. The same thing we said with pulmonary hypertension. This is something that in the beginning, when it starts, doesn't cause you shortness of breath. By the time it develops and worsens, by the time you get short of breath from it, it's already been there for a while and you may have some damage already done to your heart. So we would like to identify it early and treat it. There's several medicines available now to treat this. Uh, heart involvement, not the pulmonary part, but not the blood vessels in the lungs, but true heart involvement. And then that's fortunately fairly uncommon, but GI problems, really common. Heart heart reflux, 85% of scleroderma patients. And then you can have some involvement of the stomach and the small bowel as well, and then joint problems, aching, soreness, stiffness, sometimes swollen joints. But these uh, joint problems are common, and not everyone gets everything in scleroderma. There are different patterns of disease. But uh, one of the things that I've been interested in, and I think all patients, but also all doctors who do research in this disease, and that is what causes scleroderma. It's something that happens to you that starts uh, in adulthood, you're not born with the disease, but there's been a lot of interest on, on my part and those of lots of others. Are there genes that would make one person more susceptible to get scleroderma than someone else? And the answer to that is yes, clearly yes. But genes are not the only, uh, or having the right genes, or perhaps the wrong genes for scleroderma, that's not enough to cause the disease. There has to be something else that happens, some sort of trigger in the environment. And whether that trigger is an infection, like a bacterial infection, or a viral infection, or some sort of toxin in the environment, no one really knows what that trigger is. Maybe it's not one thing, maybe it's multiple things that can cause scleroderma. We really don't have a clue. We've looked at it in various studies. We've asked people about their occupations, where they lived, whether there's sort of the pollution, air pollution, well now, I'm in Houston, Texas, there's a lot of air pollution where I live, uh, lots of big cities have 
air pollution, but it doesn't seem to be associated with more or less scleroderma. So we really don't know what that trigger is. And uh, so what's the, the treatment of scleroderma? Uh, if you're looking at localized scleroderma or monotheal, the answer to that is very different. You want to ask, is it active? You know, sometimes people will develop a patch of morphia, it will be active for a period of a year or two, and then becomes inactive and gradually over time tends to fade. But if, if it is active, then uh, doctors can inject some cortisone kind of material into it. Uh, there's medicines like methotrexate, which we also use for systemic disease, other immunosuppressants, but you always have to ask, is the risk were the promise of improvement is the risk versus the benefit high enough? Because you certainly don't want to be in this position where uh, the risk is, is more than the benefits, or even that the risk is the same as the benefits you get from it. What you really want is that the benefits from the treatment far outweigh the risks of the treatment. And again, the treatment of systemic scleroderma, unlike morphia or localized disease, it depends on the organs involved. And you have to ask yourself as a doctor and as a patient, what are the treatment goals? For skin, and, and that depends on what's involved, as you can see from this very busy slide. For the skin, you want to decrease the fibrosis. For tendons and joints, you want to decrease the inflammation. For renos, you want to improve the circulation. That's the same for digital ulcers. And then you can go through this whole long list, and the approach to treatment is going to change depending on the organ system involved. And for people who have several organ systems involved, you're likely to be on several different kinds of medications, which I really hate, but I, I uh, would go through all the medicines people are on every time they come to clinic, and some people are on a dozen different medicines, all of which they take once, twice, or three times a day. And I frequently wonder how can they ever remember how to take all of these different medicines. And wouldn't it be nice if we said, well, take this pill, or go undergo this treatment, and then we will, your scleroderma will be cured, you only have to take it for two weeks, and then you can stop everything else. Well, we certainly are not there yet, but that is the goal. And you have to remember, again, all scleroderma patients are different. Each person is likely to have a different combination of the problem. So each person can be on a different combination of medication. And some individuals may be on little or no medicine. If they can manage, if they're not getting digital ulcers, the uh, fingertip ulcers, if the Raynaud's phenomenon is being managed by staying warm, uh, wearing extra clothes, always have gloves with you if you go into the uh, the grocery store in Houston, it's really warm, but when you go indoors, you know, the temperature drops 20 degrees, go into the freezer part of the uh, grocery store, the, the, yes. it drops, so people carry gloves with them, they feel a little funny, but, you know, your hands are more important. But I have patients who are on uh, an antacid, something like Nexium or Prilosec or Meprazole, and that's really all they're on, because they are lucky enough not to have internal organ, other internal organ involvement, or it's not progressive, and they're really doing fine and they're stable, as opposed to the other person I mentioned, 12 different medicines two and three times a day. Uh, others are on tons of medicines. So that really is just an introduction, and I'm uh, happy to answer your questions and address issues. I can't say specifically what kind of medicine any individual should be on. And while we can talk about the approach to treatment in general. So are there questions or concerns? Well, uh, so I asked how many people here, uh, how many people here have a diagnosis of systemic stroke? Lots of people. Are there people here with localized or morphia? You're convinced it's morphine and not limited, or not limited systemic. Okay, yes. Um, what is? Yeah. Well, if you have Raynaud's phenomenon and scleroderma, it's probably systemic. 
And the brain ice phenomenon is the color change of your fingers on cold exposure. Yes. I, I got lazy. And there's a lot of confusion I find between yeah. describing the different kinds of scleroderma, limited or diffuse or and I was originally diagnosed with crest. Mm -hmm. But I have pulmonary fibrosis and a positive SCL70, so I, I guess I can call myself systemic now, right? Oh, crash has always been systemic. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually we've gotten away from um, using the term crest because it doesn't help, it only causes more confusion. Right, it does. I yeah, know. yeah. And people who um, have been diagnosed with crest frequently don't have the C part, they don't have any calcinosis. So, you know, then, so in some ways, what, is, what does it mean? So I, I think the important part is it systemic, and then everyone should have a general workup to see, to stage your condition. Do you have lung involvement, heart involvement, et cetera, et cetera? And then over time, you should have some of these tests repeated on a regular basis because you need to be monitored for the development of these things. Just because you don't have uh, lung involvement on the day you're diagnosed doesn't mean that five years later you can't develop lung involvement. But you need to have pulmonary function tests on a regular basis. In terms of pulmonary hypertension that we talked about, that's diagnosed on the basis of a combination of pulmonary function tests and an echocardiogram. So everyone with scleroderma ought to have an echocardiogram on a regular basis. Usually we say once a year, sometimes, depending on how stable things are, maybe every couple of years. But nonetheless, you really need to have these sort of tests done. The question? Oh, what, how frequently? On a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, on an annual basis, and everybody at the beginning, on the di at the diagnosis, ought to have baseline tests. So we know what's normal for you, because like many of these things, people vary a great deal. So what is normal for you might not be normal for someone else. And the real key is, is it changing over time. When we look at pulmonary function tests, have you had that? Where you blow into the machine? Yeah. Hopefully People not. routinely hate it. <laughs> uh, but normal is considered anywhere from 80 to 120 percent of the predicted value. So that's a huge range. And for the first time you have that done, you don't know if you're supposed to be 120 percent and now you're only 80 percent, or whether you've always been in that 80 percent range. And so we want to get one now, and we want to get one a year from now unless you're having problems with shortness of breath, in which case you may need to, you know, your doctor may want you to get it more frequently. But then we look at changes over time. And if it's 80% now, and a year from now, and five years, and 10 years, then really you don't have to, you know that that's baseline for you. But if it goes from 80% to 70% to 60%, that's a different story. Uh, and usually what we do is get a CAT scan of the lungs if there is a real question of something going on in the lungs. A plain chest x-ray is not sensitive enough to pick up early changes of lung fibrosis. So if there's an abnormal pulmonary function test, I think it's worthwhile to do a CAT scan of the lungs, and if that looks normal, then you're fine, or you're fine for another year or two years. And I usually don't repeat the CAT scan unless people are symptomatic, they're not complaining about being short of breath, where the pulmonary function tests look like they're declining, and then you might want to repeat it. The uh, only downside to the CAT scan is some radiation exposure. So it's not something that you want to do month to month, but it certainly is something that you, you can do safely annually if there are changes in these other uh, parameters. Um, other questions? Uh, yeah. Um, you touched on about the history. Uh, can a person who has pretty or explored them pass it on to their offspring? Huh. And, and this gets to the 
the genetic component of scleroderma. There are some genes that uh, clearly are associated with scleroderma. And now out of the about 2,000 patients that I've seen, we have uh, about a little over 10 multi-case families. So it isn't, it's not 100% or 50%, it's down in the less than 10% probability that your child will also have scleroderma. But you also have to remember that your child only has half of your gene okay. and has half from uh, in the child's mother, so they may not have the right combination. Also, it's not one gene. And I sort of wish it were, because then we would have found it already. And then I'd be really famous. The risk is not high enough that it's worthwhile to do any sort of test. Yes? Now, um, I have a sister, and my daughter in law to me has localized. Would that put, I know my son, he's very concerned. He yeah. You know, he has such a small little thing, now there's two people. Is that up to increase that chance? No. Okay. Yeah, it looks as if localized scleroderma or morphia is a totally different condition than systemic scleroderma. So the chance, so it doesn't matter that you have one, you know, one parent with a family history of systemic disease and another parent with or with a family history of localized disease, it doesn't increase your chances any more than so just having one. Having two doesn't, doesn't double. Okay. Yeah. But that, that's not unusual, it's unusual, but yeah, those, those things happen. And one of the things we do in research, especially if you're looking into what are the causes of scleroderma, um, uh, <coughs> there are things that happen by chance. You know, there, are two, there are two associated things. Just because you have scleroderma doesn't mean that you can't get the flu or you can't get a cold. So those two things happen by chance alone. And in order to do research, we have to look at large numbers of patients and multiple types of exposure to be able to say that two things are linked in a more <coughs> causal fashion than just happening by chance alone. When we, we looked at um, about 500 square gram cases and 1,500 controls to see, um, to look at occupations and uh, exposures on the job, exposures, hobbies, that sort of thing. And what we found is what you would expect to find in a condition that affects women 80% of the time. And that is there are a lot of teachers, there are a lot of nurses, there are all of the occupations that are typically female-based occupations were there, but it was no different than in our controlled non scleroderma population. So, yes? Swallowing, the reflux, 
bloating, that sort of thing, those symptoms also tend to start early on in the first five years or so. But the one condition that we worry about that can happen 15 and 20 years down the line is a pulmonary hypertension. And that's why people need the echo, need to continue to get the pulmonary function hits. Over time, the chance of that happening is about 15%, which is to say the chance that it will never happen is about 85%. But it's still, it's high enough and there's treatment and it's worked well to catch it early, so people should be screened for it. And I know I have patients and I say, well, you need to get a neck roll, you need to get this, and I see patients from all over Houston, from all over Texas and Louisiana, so they go back to their own physicians and they say, Dr. May said I should get a neck roll, and the doctor said, your heart's fine, your EKG is fine, you don't need it, and they, uh, they don't appreciate that we're screening for something, we're screening for a possible complication. And the point of a screening test is that you get the result and you can make a diagnosis before people are really symptomatic. Because by then, you may have lost some organ function and you want to be able to get people on treatment before that happens. Yes? So, <clears throat> is that to say, see if you have your own but who? Pulmonary function. Right. Well, I usually screen people with the pulmonary function test, and I'll frequently get a CAT scan on the, the first visit, so we just know for sure what's normal for them. And from then on, repeat CAT scans only if the pulmonary function tests are defined. CAT scan, so no time. Okay, there are three parts of the pulmonary function test um, because it measures flows, volumes, and diffusing capacity. Now, the flow is what uh, people with asthma have problems. So, you flow if you have asthma or pulmonary fibrosis from scleroderma, that will lower the flow, and then the lung volumes usually are pretty good in asthma, but they're not so good in scleroderma. And then finally, the fusing capacity, that tends to reflect more the pulmonary hypertension than pulmonary fibrosis. But sometimes, people will have abnormal pulmonary function tests, and you may fit into this category, and you do a CAT scan, CAT scan is fine. The echo is fine, it doesn't look like there's high blood pressure, and that's normal for you. For some reason, the way they say 65% or any percent. What about the leaf that I used to have? Yeah, but that, that's based on predicted values for someone your age, sex, height, and weight. And maybe you're just a little out of the normal. So I can say 65% of the people. Well, I'm sorry, out of the average. You're normal. Beyond, you're outside the average. So he diagnosed Homer had indicated that I might have a slight case of asthma. And I did an asthma mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks. And it's kind of tipped off. The bad thing said it actually improved a little. And it had to be decreased. And so I was like, once I was sleeping, it changed more. Yeah. But I don't have that severe shortness of breath like I was. And like when I walk, I was.
causes asthma, and they're irritated. So the next day or the next few days, you have those irritated airways, and you get short of breath, and it's an asthma-like condition. So one of the things that people with scleroderma really need to do very carefully is make sure that they've got the reflux under control. And for that, you need to elevate the head of your bed. I have this discussion with every scleroderma patient, and they said, oh, I'm fine, I sleep on two pillows. Oh, no, you're going to roll off, you're going to turn over, you're going to roll off the pillow. That's not good enough. You need to have either elevate the whole head of the bed by putting bricks or something under the, the front bedstead so that the whole bed is at an angle, or you get a wedge pillow, because those are wide. And you can still turn over and be fairly comfortable. And they also start low, so you're not being creased in the middle as you would be with a few uh, pillows. And I have a handful of patients who sleep in recliners because anytime they're more flat than that, they get the reflux because they're, what should be the muscle at the bottom of the esophagus is just not functional anymore. So usually when you swallow something, it goes one way. And the, that muscle, that sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus will keep it from going back up. And I think we all remember when we were kids, you used to be able to stand on your head and you wouldn't get stomach contents come into your throat. Well, you know, that, as, as everybody gets older, the muscle gets a little weaker, but uh, in scleroderma, it gets very weak. And sometimes the only thing that's keeping stomach contents down is gravity. So you really have to be very careful about, you know, eat late at night so your stomach is empty. You elevate the head of your bed. You avoid the acid triggers, coffee, chocolate, at least at night, at least in, you know, late afternoon. Uh, and, and with all of those usual reflux, any reflux precautions, in order to keep that from happening. Yes? Does the reflux cause hoarseness as well? Yeah. I have noticed over the couple of years that I've had square derma, my voice is getting hoarser and hoarser. Yeah, that, that there can be two reasons for that. One is the reflux. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't take much because, again, it's not, you know, if you lie down and you have sort of an episode of, of a lot of reflux, you'll feel it. It'll burn That's right. all I the way up. But if you're taking the uh, antacids like the Prilosec, Nexium, the, yeah, then it's not acid anymore, but it's still fluid. Yeah. And if your bronchial tubes aren't going to like it, so you it might not wake you up in the middle of the night because it's not painful, but it's still there and it can come all the way to your vocal cord. But the other thing that can happen to make your voice worse is if you have a, a, an overlap of Sjogren's syndrome, <coughs> and dry mouth because the salivary glands aren't producing saliva the way they're supposed to. And that dries out your mouth, it dries out your nose, and it can be all the way down your throat. And people complain that uh, they can't eat a dry cracker. They have to drink a lot of fluid with it because they, they don't have enough moisture in their mouth to wet the cracker to, so that the crumbs can go down. So that's, that's another complication. And, and you know, if you're um, if trying to drink a lot of water and using some medicines, there's the oxygen, and some other medicines that can help stimulate saliva. But sometimes the ENT people can at least look down your throat, see the vocal cords, and see if there's a problem with them, and, and then identify the problem. If it looks like you're irritated from reflux, then that's good information to know. Yes? Well, I have a question about doing this in um, children. Um, I was originally diagnosed with having a brain and children, and it wasn't until I started having these medicals and my brain was getting enough protection that um, my hand surgeon was able to heal me, and he asked me if I was diagnosed with having a brain and told me that they did. Um, well, sure enough, the blood results had shown like an essential error or all the things were off the chart, but the doctor didn't think I had to so then, I went back to the camera and said, oh, I'm going to go to the 
cell steps. What we worry about is that it's not as effective as cyclophosphamide. So again, it's on the risk-benefit ratio. Yes, cyclophosphamide is risky medicine. Whenever we're talking about significant lung problems, and lung problems getting worse, then it's probably worth the risks of the medicine in order to get your lungs at least stabilized. Fortunately, there are other medicines in the uh, pipeline that are being looked at for the more scleroderma lung disease, and hopefully they will be safer than what we currently have, and either more effective or at least as effective as what we've got. So there's more interest now, which is gratifying. I've been in this business for some 30 years, and when we started out, we only had uh, one medicine that was commonly used, so we did this big clinical trial to show that it didn't work. Uh, and that was the penicillamine that pretty much nobody uses now. It's toxic medicine, doesn't seem to be effective. But since then, we now have a pulmonary hypertension medicine, we've got cyclophosphamide, methylphenolate, and I would hope this time goes on that we have a lot more medicines as um, uh, there's more interest in treating this condition, and if we seem finally to be having some success in the treatment. And uh, finally, what I, in terms of treatment, I, I want to mention something to you just so that you have it in the back of your minds. Talk about risk benefit ratios. People who have the most severe form of scleroderma, a lot of skin involvement, GI involvement, early lung involvement. The people who are likely not to do well in the first few years of disease, then we have a treatment that consists of high dose chemotherapy followed by stem cell rescue. It's a small number of patients who are even eligible for it, but for those people who are in that very, very high risk category, I think the risk benefit ratio really then is in favors. It, treatment, even this very severe and, and toxic treatment. There's another question, yes.
taking medications they kind of want the actual route. Um, you know, at what point do you recommend that medications? Well, like I was saying, there's some people, uh, patients of mine, who are on almost no medicines. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because their disease is mild. Where they've been through an initial inflammatory phase, and now and it's become somewhat quiescent. I think if there is internal organ involvement, especially in lungs or pulmonary hypertension, then that needs to be treated. You don't have a choice. Uh, there are some other conditions that are annoying, uh, uh, but aren't going to cause organ damage. And in situations like that, it's really up to the patient. You think the risks are worth the benefit. Would you rather go a more natural route? Then I have no objections to that. But when we're talking about serious internal organ disease, and I think one of the, uh, there's something in science called entertainment bias, that um, people with mild disease who go on, say, but opt for a more natural approach, and they say, see, I'm 15 and 20 years out, and I don't have any of these complications, um, but were they destined to not get those complications anyway? Because people who try a more natural route and who ended up getting worse because their disease just got worse, and they had so they fell off the natural approach, and, and you don't hear them talk. You don't hear them talking. Uh, so it, it's hard to know uh, to really look at that in an objective scientific. Thank you, Dr. Lee, so much. We have to end the session right now. Okay. Thank yes, you. one minute.